When a lonely eccentric cable guy becomes fixated on a new customer, their innocent friendship turns into a dangerous obsession. So right off the bat, I can see why this movie has this title. It starts off with this guy, Steven, going through different channels on the TV and none of them is clear. Not one. Obviously, this guy needs the cable guy and that's the first thing that comes out of his mouth. He's asking where the cable guy is already. Steven is just moving into a new apartment so we can forgive him for not having clear channels. He calls his friend Rick and briefly complains about how long the cable guy is taking. But the only thing that concerns Rick is making sure Steven hasn't called Robin. Who's Robin, you ask? Steven's ex-girlfriend. He asked her to marry him and guess what she did? She kicked him out. This is for those of you who say, the worst thing she can do is say no. Anyway, Steven says he's giving Robin her space, but we very soon find out that that's a lie because we see him calling her later that same day. He later goes into the shower and that's when the cable guy decides to show up. Steven manages to get out of the shower and to the door just in time before he leaves. And boy, is this cable guy such an eccentric character. When is Jim Carrey never eccentric though? But for real, why is he talking like this and doing all these performances? You're just here to fix the cable, my dude. To worsen things while the cable guy, his name is Chip by the way, is installing the cable. He tells Steven that his girlfriend just kicked him out and of course, Steven is terrified. How did he know? But apparently Chip knows that because in preparing Steven's service, he noticed he was previously wired across the town, but the billing just got transferred to a Robin Harris. Steven is not interested in engaging in this weird conversation, so he just goes in to get dressed. Chip is actually a little too good at this cable gig thing. I mean, look how he's operating the remote. He also did some major rearrangements to Steve's living room, because according to him, the former arrangement was affecting his cable reception. Steven comes out, signs a document, and Chip leaves. But before he does, Steven decides to take his friend's advice. Earlier, Rick told him he can give the cable guy 50 bucks and get all the movie channels for free. So Steven asked Chip if he can do that. What's the point when Minute Movies is free? But come on, you should have known this is not the guy to ask. Chip makes sure to pull his leg, trying to scare him with jail time because he offered him a bribe, but he eventually hooks him up, so it's all good. Or is it? Well, for now it is, but Steven will eventually regret making this decision. Anyway, right now, Chip gives Steven his personal pager number and offers to show him how this thing works sometime. Steven says they should do that one day, obviously just out of courtesy, and Chip says, how about tomorrow? Oh boy, he's insufferable. Steven says tomorrow is no good, and Chip asks why. He asks him if he'd just rather sit and think about his ex all day. You think Chip became human for a second when he apologizes and says he crossed the line, but he actually didn't, because when Steven tells him he actually didn't cross the line, he says, cool, pick you up at 6.30, and runs away. The next day, we see Steven giving a presentation at the office. It goes really well because everyone applauds him at the end. They're ready to hand the project over to him, but his boss chases him after the presentation and tells him if he approves the project, he can't afford to screw it up. He tells Steven that he has a lot of confidence in him, but you know, he's just saying this because of the problems he's having with his girlfriend. Steven promises he's got this. We'll get to find out if he's really got this, but right now, what he's got is a date with his cable guy, who's shouting his name from downstairs. Steven goes down to join him in his van, and they head out. This is a pretty long drive, but they finally arrive at the city's central satellite dish. Chip goes in, climbs atop the dish, and starts giving a speech like he's running for president. Call me crazy, but I'd vote for him after that speech. Haven't heard a president give a speech like that since ever. Anyway, moments later, both men are laying down in the dish and sharing stories of the neglect they faced from their parents when they were younger. Chip says he was basically raised by TV. Finally, Steven addresses the elephant in the room by telling Chip that his brother is a speech therapist. Chip acts like he doesn't know why he just told him that. Anyway, Steven doesn't stress it. They're now talking about his relationship and how his girlfriend kicked him out because, according to her, he put too much pressure on her when he asked her to marry him. Chip thinks Steven didn't listen to her, only trying to tell her what she wanted to hear. He then says, when your love is truly given, it had come back to you tenfold. Anyway, that's all for the date. Chip drops him off at home and recommends a movie that could help him get his girl back. Sleepless in Seattle is the title. I'm sure there are people like me who will be- Might have to recap that one one day. The next day, he meets Robin during his lunch break and lays down some lines which he borrowed from Chip. Then when she asks what he'll be doing tomorrow, he says he'll just be home watching Sleepless in Seattle. And it works. She says she'll come around tomorrow. There's this case on the news, by the way, about a celebrity twin who shot his brother and is currently undergoing trial. Keep that in mind. We now see Steve and Rick and a few other guys playing basketball when Chip comes in with his two balls in his hands. Okay, that didn't exactly come out right. Anyway, Steven introduces Chip to the boys, and they get to blank, but not before Chip does his very funny warm-ups. When the game starts, Chip is just being an absolute menace. He even smashes the backboard when he goes in for a dunk. After the game, Steven tells him he ruined the game and he walks away. When Steven gets home, he finds out he has 11 messages. I'm sure he thought Robin was somewhere in there, but it was just a message from his mom, one from his dad, and nine from Chip. But he finally gets some good news tonight when he hears his bell and finds out it's Robin. Sleepless in Seattle really worked his magic. I half expected it to be Chip at the door, though, to be honest. Anyway, Steven and Robin get talking, and it's going really great until it's time for the movie, and Steven realizes that his cable is out. He immediately goes to call Chip, but he doesn't even have to because Chip is at his door complaining about how he only tried to call him when he needed something from him. Obviously, Chip disconnected the cable himself. Steven just begs him to help him reconnect it because Robin is here. Chip says okay, on the condition that they'll hang out together tomorrow, and Steven says okay. Honestly, Steven would have said yes to absolutely anything at that very moment. Chip goes to reconnect it and gives his friend a piece of advice before he leaves. He tells him to resist the urge to kiss her or even touch her. He tells him it'll pay off in the end. After Chip says this, he goes home 
home. Home being his van, which is parked just outside Steven's house. Chip is also watching Sleepless in Seattle, and he takes him back to his childhood when he was watching these twins on TV and wishing for a brother of his own. Yes, the twins from the trial. His mom doesn't really care about him. She just tells him to watch TV and she leaves. Anyway, back to the present. The following day, Steven and Chip are off to their second date, and this time, Chip has a surprise for his fourth best friend. He has brought him all the way to a restaurant called Medieval Times, and from the title, I'm sure you can already tell that it's a themed restaurant. They put up a medieval show as food is served. This fight looks like it's really serious, I won't lie. But it's about to get even more serious, because this guy just called Steven and Chip to step into the sand and battle to the death. They get suited up, and they immediately start going at it. Of course, Steven is very confused, but Chip is taking this fight a little too seriously. I mean, he's the one who set this up, so are you surprised? Steven has no strength for any of that, so he's just running away. So Chip decides to fake a cramp to deceive a concerned Steven into coming around, before then hitting him in the face. That now gets Steven into the fight, and he starts putting up a good show. They're given new weapons, and they keep going. They even get on horses, and Steven is forced to fight. He just swings his spear at an onrushing Chip, and he goes to the ground ASAP. Steven ends up winning this fight, even though he never wanted to be a part of it in the first place. At home, Chip tells Steven that if Robin had seen him tonight, she'd be begging him to take her back, and then he suggests that they go again next week. They get into the house, and Steven has no messages, so I just know that he's now considering Chip's offer. Chip, by the way, already feels at home in Steven's house and is taking a drink from the fridge, but more than that, he did a massive upgrade on Steven's home theater system as a surprise, but when I say upgrade, I mean a massive upgrade. A much bigger screen, bigger speakers, and even a karaoke machine. Steven says he can't accept this because it wouldn't feel right. Chip says he has given him something more valuable than all of this. Friendship. Wholesome. Steven tells him he has to take it all back. Chip says his friend at the pickup company isn't available till Saturday, so he has to leave it here till then. Steven says cool. The next day he's at the office and he's trying to reach Robin, and you can tell he's been trying to reach her for some time now. His boss shows up for a second to remind him it's his butt on the line if he messes up the job. Then boom, Steven gets a call from Robin, and you can see the relief on his face as he reaches for the phone. He tells her he had a great night the other time and would love to do it again, but the reply didn't come from a voice he expected to hear. It was Chip all along, not Robin. Psych! Chip suggests that they enjoy the equipment he got him, since he'll be taking it away soon. He suggests karaoke night at his place tomorrow, but you know Chip doesn't really suggest. He basically instructs. The following night, while Chip and some elderly folks are at his house enjoying karaoke night, Steven is getting his heart broken all over again by Robin, who tells him she's now seeing other people. Relatable. <laughs> he gets off the phone to find Chip on his shoulder, telling him to live a little. Steven agrees, and they toast to that. While they drink, Steven hands over the little gift he got Chip, something to help him with his lisp. Chip gets emotional and says this means a lot to him. They now get back to the living room, and Steven starts developing a connection with the only other young person in the room. He goes over to talk to her, and she says her name is Heather. He offers to get her a drink, and they start kicking it off. Meanwhile, Chip and Rick are going at each other. Obviously, there's no love between these two, who now seem to be fighting for the spot of best friend in Steven's life. Rick now goes to take the mic and starts singing. He's really entertaining the crowd, but while he's giving it his all on stage, Steven and Heather leave and go into the room to, you know, talk. But that conversation is basically just being done by Heather's hands. She's running her hands through Steven's head and face, and you can tell that this guy is in cloud nine. While he's still swimming in the clouds, Chip just bursts in through the door and takes a picture of him. The next morning, Chip makes them breakfast, and Steven says last night with Heather was exactly what he needed, but his eyes immediately cut short when Chip reveals that Heather was a girl he paid. Basically, she belongs to the streets. And of course that was the case. I mean, didn't you have questions when a girl that hot was giving you the green light? Who do you think you are, dude? George Clooney? Steven is pissed. He immediately sends Chip out of his house. Chip begs for a second chance, but Steven is not even listening. The next day, we see Chip step into this restaurant in a disguise and go straight to the toilet where he pays off the janitor to take a break. That's the restaurant where Robin is on a date with another guy. The guy goes off to the bathroom and Chip starts tormenting him. He literally enters the toilet stall with him and dips his face into the toilet bowl. Ugh, I'm totally getting a new face if this ever happens to me. But Chip is not even done with him yet. He throws him out and starts messing up his entire appearance. He even blows some air into his mouth and throws him to the floor. And what's this man's crime? Going on a date with Chip's best friend's girlfriend. Later that night, the bizarre story is on the news as Stephen watches. But because of the disguise, Stephen cannot recognize the sketch of his friend. Yet again, we see an ad of a movie made about that trial we mentioned earlier, the one involving the twins. The next day, Chip goes to Robin's apartment and tells her a secret admirer ordered an upgrade for her cable. She asked if it was a man named Stephen, and he basically says yes. So she lets him in. He does some work on her cable, but most of the work he does is as a wingman for Stephen. He just keeps telling Robin that she is all Stephen thinks about and talks about. He even makes up some story about him once asking a woman to marry her, and the woman asking to take a break, only for her to pass away. He basically tells her sometimes you don't know what you've got till it's gone. After that Oscar-deserving performance, he leaves, and maybe he should also be given the award for Wingman of the Year, because immediately after he leaves, Robin picks up the phone, calls Stephen, and the first thing she says is, I love you. She pretty much wants to get back together ASAP. Stephen is so happy, but one person that isn't so happy about this is Rick, because Robin's call basically means that Stephen will no longer be going to the rock concert with him tonight. Rick is obviously so mad at him, but he still drops him off at home. Gets you a friend like Rick. Stephen is now running into his apartment building under the rain, when Chip shows up and tells him what he did. Chip says he's sorry about the other night, and wants to make it up to him, but Stephen is not open to that. He tells Chip thank you for his efforts, but he says he doesn't have any room in his life for a new 
friend. Chib is heartbroken, but he acts like it's no big deal. But we know it's a really big deal. A tremendously big deal. The following morning, he calls Robin from on top of a pole and tells her something seems to be wrong with Steven and that he hasn't seemed like himself lately. Robin says everything is perfect and he says okay and hangs up. Meanwhile, at the office, Steven is being praised for a job well done at work. His secretary comes in and says she needs to talk to him multiple times, but he keeps pushing her off. Then he sees he should have listened to her when two cops come in and tell him he's under arrest for receiving stolen property. I recognize one of those cops from the karaoke night. They cuff him and take him away as he remembers the karaoke machine and the big screen Chip gifted him. That's definitely what the cops are referring to. He's thrown behind bars and his dad comes to see him. He gives them Chip's name and tells them he works with the cable company. But the police look him up and they find out that there's no one named Chip Douglas with the cable company. And there's more bad news. No bail hearing today. So Stephen will have to spend the weekend in county lock up. This weekend went south super quickly. But guess what? There's more. When he goes out to meet his lawyer, it's Chip he sees. Chip says his real name is Larry Tate. Quite the last name. And he's here to get him out. Stephen asks why he's doing this to him. And he just says he's not doing anything but teaching him a lesson. That he can be his best friend or worst enemy. Chip just keeps worsening matters for Stephen as he opens his shirt and puts his chest against the glass to show him how his heart beats for him. The inmates there are already salivating, thinking he's fresh meat. Stephen now shouts to the guard that this is the guy who framed him, but Chip has the guard in his pocket too. I mean, who doesn't want free cable? Anyway, it's Rick who finally comes and gets him out of here, and you can tell he's still mad at him, but Stephen reminds him that it was his idea to offer the cable guy a bribe in the first place. Anyway, Rick says he'll get his guy in research to look into this Chip Douglas guy. Rick mentions that the Chip Douglas name sounds familiar. Hmm, it does, doesn't it? We now see Stephen and Robin going to his parents' house, and guess who opens the door? You guessed right. Chip. Robin invited him. Stephen pulls him aside and tells him he can call the police on him right now. But Chip says if he does, he'd show Robin the picture of him with Heather. Of course, that paralyzes Stephen. At dinner, Chip is entertaining everyone with that story about when he and Stephen went to medieval times together. Next, they play a game named Corn Password. Everyone seems to be having the time of their lives with this game except Stephen, who eventually can't take it anymore and bursts out. The fact that he's the only one who knows that Chip is just acting out a script is killing him, so he lashes out. But Chip acts like Stephen is just crazy. This is exactly what the Gen Z kids would call premium game gaslighting. And it's working. Robin tells Steven he's being a jerk, and Chip uses that opportunity to get closer to him and whisper in his ear that Robin shown him the birthmark on her left shoulder, and it was very hot. And Steven immediately punches him in the face. After that, Chip stands up, heads to the door, looks at Steven, and tells him he forgives him before leaving. What a fantastic actor this guy is. And I mean Chip, not Jim. The next day, Steven heads into the office, and what he sees on his computer is a video of him and Robin having a conversation on his couch. Not so much of a big deal, right? Well, except it actually is, because he's talking shit about his boss, and the video is showing on the computer of everyone in the office. Of course, he loses his job. He's with his things in the parking lot when all the cars start beeping and blinking. Steven is losing his mind now. He quickly runs into his car and drives straight home. At home, he gets a call from Rick, who has figured it all out. Basically, Chip is deeply troubled. He was fired from the cable company for stalking customers and is known for using the names of television characters like Chip and Ernie Douglas from My Three Sons and Larry Tate from Bewitched. That's why the Chip Douglas name sounded familiar. It's okay if you don't know any of those shows, though. Those are 60s and 70s television. Steven finds a secret camera Chip installed in his house takes it out, locks his doors, closes his blinds, and then settles in to watch TV. What's on TV? That same case of the twins. It's all coming together now, isn't it? Well, not for Steven. At least not yet. He dozes off watching TV, and is woken up by his doorbell buzzing. Guess who it is? Just take a wild guess. Of course, it's Chip doing anything to get into Steven's house. And when I say anything, I mean anything. He literally breaks into his house. And this is a beautifully shot scene, because the glare in Chip's eyes makes him look more like a monster. And then his voice is warped in that way monsters in movies talk. Chip now starts chasing him all around the house. But alas, it was just a dream. Steven is actually woken up by his phone ringing. He answers the phone and it's Chip. This guy is really haunting him at this point. Steven wants to resolve this, so he asks to talk in person. But Chip says no and suggests that he's hanging with Robin. Steven immediately drives up to Robin's apartment, and it's not a good sign that her neighbor comes out to tell him. She just left with the man from the cable company, and he said they were going for a ride on the information superhighway. Steven immediately knows where they're headed, because he's been there before. He drives straight to the central satellite dish, and of course, that's where Chip and Robin are. Chip is being his normal animated self, but Robin says she just wants to go home and that she's worried about Steven. But things quickly escalate and Robin is now hanging by a thread, almost literally. Steven comes to save her, but he first has to contend with Chip. Steven lands a few punches, which corrects Chip's lisp and brings it back in only a matter of seconds. But one headbutt from Chip was all that was needed to momentarily knock Steven out. Chip now starts taking Robin higher up and Steven immediately follows. When they get to the top, Steven asks Chip what his plan is and he says he doesn't really have a plan. He's just winging it, like me, with his YouTube channel. A chopper shows up and Robin frees herself from Chip and runs to hold Steven. 
Chip tells Steven, I just wanted to be your friend. Before he starts talking to the aircraft, like it's his mother. It was never there for him. He's delivering a monologue to the helicopter and talking about how television raised him. After his monologue, he attempts to self-delete, but Steven grabs him and holds him. Steven is saying anything to try and get Chip not to clap himself, but Chip pulls himself up a little, looks Steven in the eye, and says, don't you understand, Steven? Somebody has to kill the babysitter. Then he lets himself go. I have no idea what that means. As he's landing, everybody in the city is sitting in front of their television, waiting for the final verdict on that lingering case of the twins. But just as the reporter was about to announce the verdict, Chip lands on the dish, and everyone's cable in the city goes off. But guess what? Chip doesn't die. He's taken away by the medics. But before he's wheeled off, Steven shows up and asks for his real name. Chip says it's Ricardo. You just know he's lying. But Steven and Robin don't really care anymore. He's another person's problem now. And that person is this medic who's flying the chopper. He makes the mistake of telling Chip, hang in there, pal. You're going to make it, buddy. Chip asks him if he's really his buddy. And the unsuspecting guy says, yeah, sure you are. Chip gives him a very devious smile. From that smile alone, you can use your imagination to create another full movie with the cable guy and the medic guy. Moral of the story, Jim Carrey.